We've built microscopes that see cells, electrons, even individual atoms. We've collided particles to look deeper and deeper inside matter. But is there a smallest possible length below which nature refuses to let us look into it? It turns out there is one such length, and it's called the Planck length. And this idea doesn't come from one area of physics, but from combining the deepest truths of quantum mechanics, gravity, and special relativity. Stage 1. The forces between two electrons. Let's begin with a familiar setup. Two electrons sitting in space at some distance are from each other. What forces act between them? Two main forces that act on them are the force of gravity and electric repulsion. Gravity tries to pull them together, and because they are like charges, therefore they repel other. The gravitational force between two masses is given by Newton's gravitational law, which tells us the force of gravity is g times m squared divided by r squared. The electric repulsion, on the other hand, comes from Coulomb's law, which says the electric force is e squared divided by 4 times pi times epsilon naught times r squared. If you take the ratio of these two forces, you notice something amazing. The r squared term cancels out. So the comparison between electric and gravitational force doesn't depend on how far apart the electrons are. That ratio turns out to be around 1 followed by 42 zeros. That's 10 raised to 42. So electric repulsion is that much stronger than gravity at the scale of particles. But then you might wonder, if gravity is so weak, why does it dominate on big scales like planets and galaxies? That's because positive and negative charges cancel out overall, making electric effects vanish for large neutral objects. But gravity is always attractive and never cancels. That's why it becomes dominant when we zoom out. But at tiny scales, electric forces are highly dominant. This brings us to stage two, where quantum uncertainty joins the game. See, classical physics alone can't take us to the smallest scales. We need quantum mechanics because nature starts acting fuzzy and uncertain when we try to look too closely into it. Imagine trying to catch an electron in a very small trap so we can see exactly where it is. At first, it sounds reasonable, but the universe doesn't work that way. The closer you try to pin down the electron's position, let's say, inside a tiny space of size r, the more violently it starts resisting. This is a built-in rule of nature, or a fundamental rule called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. It says that the more accurately you try to know where a particle is, which means the position of the particle, the less accurately you can know how fast it's moving or in which direction. This is because, at the quantum level, that is for very small things like electrons, particles don't just exist at a single point. They're more like spread out waves. If you want to pinpoint exactly where a particle is, you have to squish its wave down to a very small region. The more precisely you try to find its position, the more you have to concentrate that wave. When you squish a wave, it naturally becomes less clear how it's moving or what its momentum is. So if we confine an electron to a space of size r, the uncertainty in its momentum must be at least h-bar divided by r. That symbol, written as h-bar, is just Planck's constant h divided by 2 times pi. It's a tiny but very important number in quantum mechanics that tells us the scale at which uncertainty kicks in. Also, since energy is tied to momentum by special relativity, we can say the energy uncertainty becomes about h bar times c divided by r. Now here's where it gets wild. If that energy uncertainty becomes big enough, say, equal to the rest mass energy of an electron, which is m times c squared, which is roughly this value, then something remarkable can happen. That much energy in a tiny space can lead to the creation of new particles. In other words, 
trying to look too closely inside a particle actually creates new particles. Oh my God. If we solve for the scale where this happens, we find R becomes H bar divided by M times C. That gives a length of about 10 raised to minus 13 meters, smaller than an atom, but still bigger than a nucleus. At this scale, the world behaves in ways that are dramatically different from our everyday experience, governed by the laws of quantum electrodynamics, QED. Next, let us enter into stage three. Energy becomes mass. Mass fuels gravity. Let's now bring in energy's other face, mass. As we shrink R further, uncertainty in energy grows. But energy and mass are equivalent, thanks to Einstein's E equals mc squared. So this growing energy starts to contribute to gravitational pull. As energy increases, the equivalent mass rises, and thus gravity strengthens. Earlier, gravity was negligible compared to electric force. But now, as effective mass grows, gravity starts catching up. At some point, the huge electric to gravity ratio we saw before, that 10 raised to 42, begins to shrink. It means that this small region is a region of high energy and mass density, resulting in a strong gravitational pull. Now we enter stage four, when gravity and electric forces are equal. Imagine going even further, squeezing space so tightly that the gravitational attraction between particles becomes as strong as their electric repulsion. This refers to confining energy and matter into an incredibly small volume. If we set the ratio of electric force to gravitational force as one and use the known constants, we find the necessary mass becomes huge. This isn't about actual particles with that mass. It's about the effective mass energy that would need to be concentrated in a tiny region to make gravity this strong. Now we enter stage five which is the final barrier where black holes appear. What happens if we go even smaller? From general relativity, we know that if a mass becomes too compact, meaning too much mass is squeezed into too small a space, it bends space-time so strongly that even light can't escape. The speed needed to escape such a region is called the escape velocity. If this escape velocity becomes equal to or more than the speed of light, c, then nothing can get out. Not light, not particles, not even information. This leads to the idea of the Schwarzschild radius. It's a special radius linked to any given mass, m, and is calculated as 2 times g times m divided by c squared. It's the critical boundary around a mass beyond which not even light can escape that mass. The point of no return. Nothing inside that boundary, not light, not matter. Not even the measurements you were trying to make can escape. This blocks all the access to what lies within, making the region completely unknowable from the outside. Now comes the mind-blowing part. If we take that effective mass, the one needed to make gravity as strong as electric repulsion, and plug it into the uncertainty principle, we get a length scale. It comes out to the square root of g times h bar divided by c cubed. That's the Planck length. It's roughly 1.6 times 10 raised to minus 35 meters. That's one followed by 34 zeros after the decimal point. So this Planck length is not just super small, it is fundamentally unreachable. Try to explore or examine anything smaller than this, and the very act of exploration creates a black hole, hiding what you wanted to see. The Planck length is only one piece of the puzzle. Alongside it, we get other Planck units, like Planck mass and Planck time. Planck time is the time light takes to travel one Planck length. That's the Planck length divided by C. It works out to about 10 raised to minus 44 seconds. That's the shortest meaningful time interval in physics. Below this, even time itself may not make sense. And that's why we say the very beginning of the universe, the Big Bang, starts after Planck time. Before that, 
Our current physics simply cannot describe what was happening. Space, time, energy, everything breaks down into a quantum mess. That's the earliest edge of the universe we can even talk about meaningfully. So what does this all mean? It means that the combination of quantum mechanics, special relativity, and gravity sets an ultimate limit on how finely we can investigate nature. That limit is not man-made. It's not a technology issue. It is baked into the universe itself. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Also, you can support my channel by joining our community and becoming a member. So good!